discussion of that committee. Um, they're trying to host um, a practical management supervisory conversation series. So this is the second one. Um, and the goal of these conversations is to have some kind of synchronous forum for everyone to think and discuss about some topic together. Um, so we will be recording this session and then a link will be sent out to those people who are registered. And there'll also be um, a brief assessment following the program, so be sure to stay tuned for that. So today we're going to talk about dysfunctional workplaces. Um, there we go. Uh, and we have some ideas for future topics, or excuse me, the committee does. Um, they include coaching and training, uh, change management activities, corrective action, and budgets. I know many of the attendees have um, submitted thoughts about what they would like to hear about. Um, and so um, if you have more ideas, please send them in. Uh, as we've said in the last one, we're just trying out how this works, how this kind of forum works, and hoping it's helpful. So let us also know about your experiences. Um, and then today we're really focused on the problems that the previous panelists and I decided were those that you lose sleep over. So Naoma Reed was our previous panelist. So um, if there are some topics that we're not addressing today related to dysfunctional workplaces or any other topic, um, stay tuned. So today we're going to talk a little bit about dysfunction generally in workplaces and then give you some tips and resources uh, and then get into our discussion. So let me move on to who is actually here presenting. Lance Werner is here on the line with me. He was Library Journal's 2018 Librarian of the Year and he is also Executive Director of the Kent District Library in Michigan. So welcome, Kent, or Lance, excuse me. Sorry, I'm looking at the wrong words. Well, thank you so much. I'm really excited to be with everybody today. Um, yeah. You know, I don't, I, I just to warn you, I don't take myself very seriously. Um, I just tell everybody I'm just Lance and uh, I'm just a regular old person. There's not a thing that's exceptional about me. I consider myself uh, one gear in a big machine here at KDL. And I feel blessed to work with the smartest people that I know. And um, I've been actually you know, I've been in a leadership role in library land for about a decade now in public libraries, but I'm a former president of the Michigan Library Association, a former chair or president of the board of our library cooperative. And um, before I got into libraries, I was, uh, I served as an, an attorney and um, worked at the library in Michigan as library law specialist. And then um, before I went to law school, I actually was a small business manager and uh, spent a couple of years doing that. So I have lots of uh, management experience and lots of leadership experience. Um, I consider myself a servant leader and I try to lead from a place of, and you're going to think it sounds corny, but I think it's important, a uh, place of kindness, love, and empathy. And I believe the mushy stuff matters, and I think it's important to be humble. And um, I'm really looking forward to talking about dysfunction today. Thank That's you. Great. That was a great introduction. I feel actually the same way. I'm, I'm just a person um, who happens to be a librarian and happens to manage people. I do enjoy both those things, um, but I'm just, um, as my, my uh, screen here says, um, I'm chair of the Lama Mentoring Committee, and I'll be past here next year. Um, and then I, my title is Head of Database Integrity here at UK Libraries. Um, and I also am a real believer in empathy and um, kind of like what you call the mushy stuff, you know, kind of making sure that people enjoy their jobs because we're here many hours a day. And so I think it's really important to at least try and make it somewhat of a better place than it is now. So, okay, so let's get into our topic. Um, Okay, this is not working. There we go. Um, so dysfunction can manifest itself in many ways. Okay, sorry, the screen is slow there. There we go. Um, and these are just some of the ways that I thought of just when I thought of dysfunction, you know, what, what comes to mind. So um, poor communication, office politics, favoritism, being passive aggressive, bullying and having power plays or micromanagement, those are just some of the things that came to my mind. Um, of course, there's millions of other ways that dysfunction occurs um, in institutions and in libraries and in the workplace. Um, of course, dysfunction can be caused by lots of different things. Um, sometimes it's boredom, sometimes it's lack of self-esteem or of training. Um, it could be even fear. 
are there other words that you think of um, when you when you think of uh, dysfunction, Lance? Sorry. Well, yeah, I, I think you know, like you said, I think there are a variety of ways that uh, um, a variety of things that cause dysfunction on a team. Um, I think that uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, depending on the situation, maybe. Um, the expectations haven't been clearly stated. Maybe there is some sort of, like you mentioned, power play. I know that sometimes negativity seems to seems to move very quickly in organizations. In fact, I think that negativity seems to man manifest itself in groups a lot more quickly than pos positive behavior. And so I think that it's possible to have caustic groups, and then it becomes a power base in um within the organization and you know serves to undercut and causes people to feel disenfranchised um but i mean it can really come from a variety of places sometimes you know it is true that there are some people that are just negative people they have their own thing going on they're negative for a variety of reasons other times it's people that are just generally frustrated because they feel like there's not enough accountability it could be anything. Um, it could be work environment. Maybe it's too hot. Maybe it's too cold. Maybe there's something else going on that's deeper and more serious. There's a variety of things that can cause dysfunction on our team. A lot of times I've been in situations where I wasn't in, you know, I was in a leadership role, but I wasn't at the top of the organization. But two of the people that were leaders in, in higher level leadership roles than I was in were fighting with one another. And the tension from their fights caused uh, the whole environment has become tense, and I think they were oblivious to that. So I think that I think there are a variety of reasons, and I think it's important to take everything into consideration when confronting dysfunction and having a thorough understanding of where it's coming from, and you know, and have, letting the you know the people that are involved have a thorough understanding of what the implications of their behavior are. I also mm -hmm. think accountability is important, but I think accountability to ourselves is the most important. So holding others accountable, yes, but I think more than anything, I think we are accountable for our own behavior and um, in our, what we say and what we do. So I think that's it's always important to keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I guess I'm done preaching. No, no, that's totally fine. Well, that leads us straight into the next um, slide. So there's this kind of idea of spheres of influence, and I don't really know where this concept originated. Um, I first learned about it from Stephen Covey, um, who – couches um, just in general situations in those that we have control over, those that we have influence upon, and then those that we don't have any control or influence upon. And so I think what you were just saying about accountability is we really have a lot of control and accountability over ourselves, right? And then we have influence over those that we manage or supervise, but there's many things in our lives and in our work lives especially that we have no control or influence over. And I think those kind of um, caustic groups, like you called them, um, like the spread of negativity, like sometimes that is just kind of out of our control, or like your example of the two administrators who are not getting along, that you know, there's very little we can do about that. And so I think when you're thinking about dysfunction, sometimes there are things that are just things that you do have immediate control over, some things that you have influence over, but some things, of course, too, that it's just the way the institution is or it's a historical behavior. Um, and so those are things that really you shouldn't be, as we were talking yesterday, um, I mean, Lance and I, when we were preparing for this presentation, of it's really, if, you're, if it is out of your control, it's really kind of a waste of your energy to um, try and have influence over those things. Um, but So in other words, it's important to identify, um, just to say that in the reverse, what you do have control and influence over and try and manage those areas um, particularly about dysfunction. Um, another thing I wanted to say about this kind of sphere of influence idea is that um, the sphere of influence that you have does take a long time to build um, kind of your uh, your relationships with people to establish kind of those trusting relationships does take a long time. Um, and making sure that, you know, you're successful and the people around you are successful in that kind of trusting relationship um, can create this influence that you have. Uh, one thing that Lance, you said yesterday that I thought was really good was that you must give in order to get, and I think that kind of plays into this influence idea. I agree. Um, I just want to take a moment to recognize that uh, uh, we had a, a participant uh, mention 
this notion of clicks versus us versus them disease. And I want to acknowledge that, yes, excuse me? I just said, yeah, I, I have my chat moved over to the side, so I can't see that. So, yeah, okay. Yeah, and I just want to take just a moment before we uh, talk about spheres of influence, or I discuss mm -hmm. spheres of influence, too, to say that, you know, clicks, I, well, I think, first of all, it's important to acknowledge that if you're working in a professional capacity and full-time in, in an environment, you spend as much time with your coworkers as you do your own family. So I think it's absolutely critical in those types of environments to have a familial culture as much as humanly possible. And in order for that to happen, I think it's also important <clears throat> to be kind and empathetic and loving and allow yourself to be vulnerable and to give everybody the benefit of the doubt, even when they, perhaps they don't deserve it. I think that there's a lot of people that mention this whole notion of the golden rule, you know, treat others as you want to be treated. I think that's baloney. I think you try to treat other people better than you want to be treated. And I feel like in the situations with clicks, it's natural that people tend to congregate together. There's some friendships that happen at work and people hang out together. But what's important for click is fine so long as it's not exclusive. So long as it's inclusive of others and you have friends, but your friends and your group is friends with other groups and everybody has their equality and there's, there's a levelness to it and everybody is able to work together per, in a productive way, that's okay. It's okay to have friends at work. In fact, you should have friends at work. In fact, the more friends that you have at work, the happier you'll be and the happier you are, the better work you'll do. And so it, it's good to have friends in, in almost familial relationships at work. And then us versus them disease, that often exists between, unfortunately, um, you know, the workforce and, and management. And I think a good way to deal with that is first acknowledge that it's, you know, if you're a manager and you're signing somebody else's check, one thing that's true that might be hard to swallow is that there's always going to be a weirdness between you and that person. They'll be honest with you and they will do their best and you owe them your, your best. So I just want to say that right out of the gate. However, I think that being a servant leader and being humble and, and putting yourself out there and being vulnerable and not speaking from a place on up of high and just talking to people, you know, eye to eye on things and respecting everybody's input and listening about people and caring about them helps break down a lot of that us versus them. So, you know, I always say that it's never a superstar that wins the basketball game. It's always the team. And so as long as your organization has you know, a, a good direction and something you believe in, everybody understands what's going on, it's been communicated effectively, people can get behind it. It's the team that's going to pull together, and, and by pulling together to accomplish something, it's a team, the whole team wins together, and it gets rid of a lot of this us versus them thinking. Okay, I wanted to make sure that I had a chance to, you know, touch on that, and um, I really appreciate the, the question. Um, going to spheres of influence, I think that it is important to, as much as it's possible, it's much easier said than done, but to not let things that are beyond your control of influence um, drag you down. Don't be obsessed with them. I'm, for instance, I work for the state of Michigan, and I worked for the Department of History, Arts, and Libraries, and I helped the public fight so legal issues, and I was administrative law judge and a whole bunch of other stuff. But one thing about the Library of Michigan is that it is funded every year out of an appropriation um, out of the general fund of the state. And so the legislature has to appropriate the money every year. And when I was there every year, there was a group of you know, legislators that did its darndest to cut funding for the Library of Michigan and even go as far as even contemplating getting rid of it. And so there was, you know, a constant threat for a couple of years every year the time our funding question came up that we were going to be unemployed or furloughed or reassigned. So that was a miserable environment. But instead of being controlled by that, instead of letting that, letting that take over, what we did is people came together and everybody, you know, that was living in that environment still understood that the work that we were doing was important. And let's not focus on that. Let's focus on the next step and what I'm doing today and not spend all of our energy living in abject terror of this situation that might occur. Because to do that is to become paralyzed. And once you become paralyzed, you're ineffective, and you're just going to make everybody else miserable around you. So, you know, what you do is you all kind of huddle together and get up, you know, push each other forward and get through every day. So don't focus in on those things. I mean, you're going to have good days and bad days and allow yourself to do that. Really worry about the things that you can control. Also understand that you are responsible for your own behavior. 
and that by being kind and empathetic and loving toward others, chances are, most of the time, people around you will also be that way, and your, you, what, the things that you're doing and the energy that you're bringing will spread to others. It's not going to take as, you know, hold as quickly as negativity does, but it will take hold. And then you start building a familial environment where people feel safe, and it's safe to have meaningful, constructive conversations. You don't necessarily have to agree, but it's safe, and you give everybody the benefit of the doubt that comes back to you. So, um, yeah, that's about my spheres of influence. You have your own control of yourself, but maybe those that are right around you, and you can be kind and empathetic and loving toward them and, you know, and deal with it. Also know that if something is broken, you need to acknowledge that. If somebody's not behaving that way to you and is being difficult or combative, I think that it's important to, to address that. I don't think that we need to be victims in this thing. I think what we need to do is practice kindness, love, and empathy, and I think the kindest thing you can do to somebody is be honest with them that there's an issue, and not in a biting, personal sort of way, in a constructive way. Okay, I'm done preaching there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, I think you're also just leading straight into our next topic, uh, or at least the next slide, is building a climate of trust. Um, I think in order to um, feel safe in your culture, wherever you are, like you were just mentioning, um, trust does play a big role in that. Um, and I think uh, yesterday when we were preparing for this, um, we were talking a lot about trust being um, able to be vulnerable so that um, when you're in a vulnerable position that um, you're relying on people to treat you in some kind of fair or honest manner. Um, and for me, that seemed like a pretty good definition of trust. Um, so those were some kind of thoughts that we had around having this culture or climate of trust in your workplace. Uh, one idea was to clearly communicate your values. Um, you really shouldn't make people guess what your values are or what really matters to you or um, even values um, in the positive sense or even in the negative sense. You know, communicate what gets on your nerves um, so that people don't have to kind of tiptoe around you. Um, Obviously, you should treat your employees with respect. Um, you should treat them as adults and expect, you know, adult behavior from them. Um, you can involve everyone in problem solving, not just go to, you know, one single person or just listen to, you know, your manager or supervisor. Um, in the same way of communicating your values to everyone, you should also share, share the same information with everyone so that if there's some new thing coming along or some, you know, event like you were talking about with your budget, um, that the same information is communicated to the, everyone at the same time or, you know, in the same timely manner. Um, and then, like you also were just saying, Lance, um, you should confront hard issues. Um, you should make sure that things don't kind of slide uh, and don't be afraid to do that. You need to, you know, be honest about the situations that you're in and confront them in a timely fashion. And then um, just to kind of build that team mentality, like you were mentioning, of the teams being the people who win the game, it's not the individuals, you should also be kind to people who are absent. I think that does play into what you're saying about, Lance, what you're saying about um, being kind and loving to people. Um, I think mm -hmm. it's easy to to fall into kind of, you know, did you know what she said? You know, that oh, kind of stuff. stuff. Yeah, and so it's um, it really just goes to being a family and creating that culture of trust um, in a familial way as much as you can. So did you have anything that you wanted to add here? Well, I see some, some questions here uh, or some oh, comments. Okay. And, and uh -huh. this idea um, of creating a fa familial workplace, I think it's something that needs to be, uh, you know, something you people should strive for. Um, and again, I think it's also true that a fish usually rot from the head. So if uh, you're in a situation where, you know, there's, there's dysfunction at the top levels of the organization, it might not be a good fit. It might be something that is outside of your, you know, sphere of influence, and it might be something, a place where maybe you should not be in that environment. You should seek an environment out where you will find what you're looking for and will feel supported and will feel like you can, you know, speak your mind and be in a safe environment. I also think that these, uh, the, the, the questioner, the, the commenter that said that there needs to be clear roles and responsibilities and people need to understand what's expected of them and get feedback, I think that's absolutely critical. I right, think that it's right. absolutely critical to have a, a good understanding of what expectations there are of you and your capacity. And, um, and again, I think it's about holding yourself accountable, and I think it's perfectly reasonable to 
and, and feedback should be sought out. So building a climate trust, circle back to that. Um, oh, I see another one here. There's a conflict where a person who is in the librarian is resentful of the benefits that come with the job as defined. Um, oh, okay, hold on a second. It hopped on me. Here's the thing. Um, get people that are looking at other people and, you know, get resentful about so-and-so, you know, frankly, uh, what somebody else is getting is none of your business. Yeah, it's none of my business what some other library director may, I mean, that's between them and I, I can't do my job if I'm focused in on what somebody else is doing and getting. All I know is if I do my best job, then I, you know, good things are going to come to me. So instead of spending your, people spending their energy on being resentful toward others, spend your energy on doing a good job and thinking about your work and trying to accomplish them, you, you know, you're part of the mission. Um, okay, so, sorry, I got sidetracked by these, uh, these questions coming up on. No, it's um, fine, because that is so. really the sphere of influence. Like, you don't have any influence at all over what somebody's benefits are or pay. So, yeah, no, no that's totally related, yeah. You just, yeah, focus in on your own stuff. And it, you remember, you know, <laughs> be accountable to yourself. Um, when it comes to building trust, going back to this whole notion that you have to, you know, be vulnerable and you have to be willing to put yourself out there and somebody's going to abuse your trust, but that doesn't mean you should stop trusting everybody. I mean, you're going to get knocked down. You're going to stand up again. That's what life's all about. So I think it's absolutely critical, again, going back to this whole notion that we spend more time at the work in our workplace than we do at our own homes in a lot of cases. It's important that the work is something that is nurturing to you and it's enriching and you're energizing because in that sort of environment, you're going to do your best work. And we find ourselves at a time, particularly given the OCLC study about voter perceptions, we need to be doing our best work. We need to change the story about what's going on in library land, in public library land. And I think that um, we need to have that sort of trust with our coworkers because we need to have that sort of trust of the people that come into the library and are using the service. I think it's absolutely critical. Have you ever gone to a restaurant and walked in and it was obvious that the manager was fighting with the employees and there's an energy there? I mean, I know it sounds sort of like lava lampy, you know, patchouli oil, you know, power crystal hippie stuff, but I'm telling you, if you walk into a place and there's been, there's a, you know, a really like anger in the air. You can feel, you don't want to be in those places. You want to leave that restaurant. It feels gross. Your library can feel the same exact way if there's a lot of negative energy. And so there's a lot of negative energy and people are arguing because there's no trust. People aren't giving each other the benefit of the doubt. People aren't trying to nurture each other and pick each other up. People forgot that they're there to accomplish a mission, a larger mission. Maybe they haven't heard the mission. Maybe they're not being held accountable. There's a lot of different things. Back to this employee who's resentful, I think that that employee needs to be talked to. I think maybe the employee needs to do challenges. I think that, you know, being clear and concise and direct is a kindness to this employee who's being resentful. Because I think the employee needs to be reminded, you know, you need to worry about what you're doing. And if that employee is not capable of doing that, if it's going to be an issue that goes on and on and on, maybe that employee shouldn't work there anymore. Because they're never going to be happy. And why would they want to go to work every day and be miserable? I know it's tough, but that's part of that's part of the the equation. Some you know sometimes the job's not a good fit, and so keeping somebody in a job that's not a good fit and letting them come to work every day miserable is going to erode trust, spread around to a bigger group, start toxic groups, and create kind of a chain reaction. So I think that you let people you give them a chance to be successful, and you nurture them and pick them up, and give them what they need to be successful. And if they're unable to be successful, then it's time for them to move on. I think that is a really, really good response. Um, let me move on to the next slide because I think this um, is, I think people are saying already what's on the slide, so I'm glad we're on the same page. Um, so somebody, as you said, did mention um, setting boundaries and ground rules. Um, and if, if it's, you know, just your department, maybe those are the right words, but policies if you're the director like yourself. And then work to maintain those because I think, um, mm -hmm. as you're saying, keeping people accountable, um, you know, you can have as many boundaries and things as you like, but I think if you don't remind people of them or keep them accountable to them, then it's, you know, easy to forget some of those things. Well, and then, just, um, um, yeah, one thing ahead. I just want to interject, I just want to say that I, I keep my, my accountability around my own time and my, myself, my, mm -hmm. what I do is the highest. I, I have really high standards for my own work. 
And I think that's really important for all of us to do that. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then we were talking about the climate of trust on the last slide. I think, and I, so I'm saying that we need to work to build this climate of trust. I'm trying to emphasize that word um, because, like, as we were hearing yesterday, you mentioned that it's easier to be a complainer, really, than to be kind or to be vulnerable in this kind of trusting environment. Um, mm -hmm. That's absolutely that's okay. correct. Yeah. Um, it is easier to complain and be negative and close yourself off than it is to be vulnerable and put yourself out there and extend kindness. I have a question here about um, inequalities in the workspace, and I will say that beyond, or, there's no doubt that there are inequalities in workspaces. There is a, uh, and I don't mean to get political here, but I mean clearly there is a, you know, a discrepancy between what males and females make. Clearly there's such a thing as white privilege. Clearly there's all these sort of inequities. I think in our case, we are looking at all those things and we are trying to take steps to address some of those inequalities. I can't speak to other work environments. I hope others are being sensitive to that um, because it's a problem. It's a huge problem. Um, so tenure and union environments. We have a union environment here. We have the UAW. We have over, I want to say, we have 250 of our 350 employees that are in the union. It might even be more than it might be 275 employees. Just because there's a, union, there's a union doesn't mean that, um, it, you know, we unfortunately uh, separated from a lot of union employees. And tenure is not something I've had to deal with, so I can't speak to it. I despise when people speak about things they have no clue about what they're talking about. I refuse to talk about it in the abstract. I don't know. So I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah. Again. It's, it's okay to be emotional. The mushy stuff matters. Um, I think, again, I think really comes down to personal accountability and, you know, making a commitment that you're going to treat other people better than you want to be treated and hold yourself to the highest standards. And remember, it's the team that wins and not, not, not the individual. And um, as far as resentful employees go, I think it's also a mistake to focus in. Um, if you're on a team and somebody who's being negative and resentful, if you give that energy, you know, and if you pay a lot of attention to that and you, you know, something they're focusing on, you're not doing your best work. So uh, I think the best thing to do is to, if you have an issue with another employee, um, is to tell your supervisor if you're in that role, if you're a manager, I think you need to deal with that employee directly. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. Um, I think, like I'm saying, the, it is a lot of work to make this climate of trust happen. Um, and so I think it kind of tied in with that is to have um, the knowledge that you may be doing a lot of emotion work yourself. So it's uh -huh. important to know that you should practice your own kind of self-care and make sure that, um, as I use the term here, compassion fatigue doesn't set in. So like that you just kind of get tired of you know, being nice to people all the time or tired of, you know, making this trustful environment um, because it's it's really important to have this, right? Because I think that does stave off a lot of dysfunction um, that may happen. And then my final tip um, is just to be aware that you may actually be the person that's causing the dysfunction. Uh -huh. um, I think when we were talking yesterday, you said something like, um, if you're surrounded by jerks, it might actually be you that's being the jerk. Um, yep. So did you have some, some story that you wanted to tell about that or or maybe something really no, I, on the slide? You were no, I, I have a – no, not around – well, it's actually <laughs> – yeah, I mean, there's been situations, and I've talked to people, and I've worked with people, and I've had people that worked for me and worked with me that would run around and say everybody's against them, and they were actually the most difficult people, you know, around them. And people were against mm. them because they weren't being obnoxious to everybody. But, you know, I think a lot of this, you know, I don't know. I have a, I do a lot of um, keynote speeches, and there's a story that I like to tell, and it's kind of a – just based on my own perception. And, and I think that, you know, I, I call it um, the, you know, the story of, uh, you know, stones and balloons. And I think what happens is throughout our life, people, you know, everybody seems, whether they even know you're not or your parents or whomever it might be, the people that are around you say things to you about you. And so you choose to believe them or you don't. And it seems like people tend to hold on to the negative things that are said about them uh, more readily than the positive things. So the negative things really are the stones. And so a lot of times, you know, issues that we're having really boil down to 
issues, you know, we may have about ourselves around self-doubt, and um, it kind of hems us in. And, you know, or they might tell you something positive about yourself and give you a balloon to pick you up. And, you know, and it, it happens our whole lives. I mean, I think it's natural to hold on to the negative stuff more. But what you need to understand is you don't have to hold on to any of that crap. I mean, you can you can hold on to the positive stuff, and you have the ability, you know, in you know, to make a huge difference. So there's nothing special about me, or you know, I think we're all kind of, you know, we have all kind of same same stuff going on. I think that we can do great stuff. We just got to kind of believe that we can. I realize that there are, there are hurdles that people have to deal with. Um, so I'm not suggesting that the playing field's level because it sure as hell is not. Um, but what I'm saying is that you don't need to let yourself be controlled by self-doubt. Um, you know, there's a lot to be said about believing that you can. Definitely. I think that's a really good analogy of the stones and balloons. I really like that. That's great. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> So our next slide is just some resources that um, we were asked to provide some resources for you to look at. Okay, I'm not sure. There we go. Um, so the first one is, there we go. Um, just something about emotional intelligence. The one that I chose to put on here was emotional intelligence, emotional intelligence 2.0 um, that came out in 2009 by Bradbury and Graves. Um, but there's many, many um, books, as we all know, about emotional intelligence. And I think that plays um, some key part in recognizing dysfunction and knowing how to deal with dysfunction because we all, you know, have our own levels of emotional intelligence. Uh, the next, um, there's an author named P.M. Forney who I'm pretty familiar with, um, and he has several different books, and some of them I think are more helpful than others. The one I chose to put on here was Choosing Civility, The 25 Rules of Considerate Conduct, um, because just like emotional intelligence, I think being considerate of people is also really important, especially in a dysfunctional environment um, where there's already lots of negativity flying around. Then um, in 2000, in this year, um, ALA put out a book called Dysfunctional Library, Challenges and Solutions to Workplace Relationships. I haven't actually read this because somebody's checked it out here at my library, so that should probably tell us something. Um, but uh, I, I want to read this, um, and I just thought I would add it here because I'm, I'm hoping that it will be really helpful here. And then finally, two years ago, Shola Richards wrote Making Work Work, the Positivity Solution for Any Work Environment, and that specifically has been really helpful for myself. Um, I just would really recommend it. Uh, during the last conversation, I mentioned this blog called Ask a Manager, and I think it still applies here, so I just added it to this resources um, list. And then I also added um, a podcast. It's called Safe for Work. It just um, changed from the podcast called I Hate My Boss. It's given by actually a friend of mine, um, Liz Dolan. And so uh, her actual topic is really about uh, safety in the workplace, like emotional safety, basically, in the workplace. Um, it's not necessarily like the not safe for work kind of thing at all. Um, so I just I wanted to share all these resources with you. Um, and then uh, the Llama Pam Committee reminded, wanted me to remind, wanted us to remind you, there you go, um, to, as you have been doing, ask questions in the chat window, um, to use invented names if you are citing somebody, and then even if you are, you know, getting a little frustrated about whatever your situation is, to keep, you know, the conversation there in the chat window um, collegial. We do have some questions that were submitted um, through that Pam survey uh, that was sent out before um, this presentation. Um, and so now I think we're ready to move on to those. So here's the first one, which I think um, Lance, you chose. So the question is, how do you handle the situation when an employee who's normally really conscientious and high performing becomes disengaged? So what's, what's your thoughts about this, Lance? Well, I mean, I've seen this happen again and again and again, and the disengagement usually, I mean, it occurs for a variety of reasons, but in my experience, more often than not, when you have somebody, it depends on how fast this transition occurs. Um, if you have somebody who's, you know, happy to be at work and happy with the coworkers and getting a lot of great work done, is kind of your go-to person, you're just thrilled with them, and then, you know, inside of like two or three weeks, they, you know, suddenly are just down in the dumps and everything's, you know, kind of suffering. More often than not, they have something going on in their, you know, personal life. Um, or, I mean, if there's been a change in their immediate work environment, maybe that's, that's an issue. The best thing to do, what I find, is to, again, 
come from a place of kindness, empathy, and love, be a servant leader, and be open and honest, and, and to go to them and, you know, invite them out for a cup of coffee and have a talk with them and, you know, express, you know, what's going on. I mean, from your perspective, I mean, in our case, it's been like, you know, I've noticed that there's, you know, it seems to, there's been some, some struggles lately, and I, you know, you had such a long history with us doing great, wonderful things, and we just think the world of you, and I know it just seems like there's something going on, and would you, would you please care to talk about it with me, because I'm here to help, um, you know, we're family, I'm here to help, and, you know, in our case, you know, usually it is something personal, I mean, sometimes it's a personal thing that we can't help with, and sometimes it is, we had one employee, um, you know, had a terrible medical diagnosis, and was just beside himself, and and so we just gave him six weeks off vacation so he could go take care of himself. You know, I mean, we could do that. We had the power. Um, maybe it's a work thing. Maybe they're having an issue with another employee. Maybe something happened. They had an interaction with uh, somebody else who was in the library that made them feel uncomfortable. Maybe I had an employee that was being sexually harassed, and so we we took care of that. I, I think having that initial conversation to determine if, if, you know, they'll open up um, is important. And if it doesn't happen at the first conversation, try again. I just, I think more than anything, you need to make them aware that, you know, the, the you know, change in their work style hasn't gone unnoticed. And, you know, reassure them that, you know, you're there for them. We're in this whole thing together. It's not, you know, it's the team that wins. It's the mission of the organization. It's everybody, like, pushing the same way. And, um, you know, so when you have somebody who's, who's faltering, I think it's important. You know what else is important is if when you're there for somebody, when things are really hard for them, I mean, I can tell everybody, it's like, I'll be here on your best day and I'll be here on your worst day. And when you're there for them, they remember that. And that becomes part of the culture of the institution. You know, when I was down and out, they were there for me. They helped pick me up. They, you know, we were there family, you know, I got knocked down, somebody picked me up again. And um, so just having that conversation be very clear and then seeing if there's anything you can do to help. Um, it might be a situation where they're just really sick of what they're doing and they're bored and maybe having career doubts, then maybe it's time to change the job description up and, you know, make other opportunities available for them. I mean, the more than anything, you first have to take the step of being vulnerable yourself, putting yourself out there and asking. What's going on and how can I help you? I think that is a great answer. I think letting them know that they're not alone is no. really, really important. So, yeah, that's fantastic. Okay. Hi, everyone. Ready for the this next is one? Cynthia. And we have a couple of questions, well, comments in the chat um, about <laughs> how do you handle tension between. Um, this is kind of two sets of issues, who um, staff members who have an MLS versus those who are on the more professional or the professional librarian track, and then how do you also handle tensions between uh, faculty versus professionals as some people feel that certain tasks are beneath them. So how do you handle those two kinds of situations? I don't want to speak to faculty. I worked in an academic law library, you know, it's a reference library, but that was 15 years ago. And I don't feel like I could speak to that with any sort of authority. It would be an abstraction for me, and I'd be doing a disservice by addressing that. But I'm happy to answer the other question. Well, so um, I am faculty um, at the institution where I am, and I think um, there are obviously tensions between, um, you know, having tenure, not having tenure, or being a peer professional or a professional. Um, and I think part of that is, um, I mean, something to remember in that situation, I think, is that we're all here for the jobs that we are hired for. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're, you know, a better person if we are, you know, non-tenured or if we are tenured or whatever. Like, it, it just means that we're here to do, you know, a certain set of jobs, and um, those are just different. Uh, I think that it's it's not really that much different than any other workplace um, in that sense of like, you know, you have someone who works in circulation and then you have someone that works in reference or whatever the case may be. And it's, it's, um, it's really hard, I think, to compare yourself in a way um, that like Lance was describing of the balloons and stones that, that you, um, 
if you start down the track of picking up stones, you know, it's, it's hard then to let them go. I think once you start noticing, oh, that person gets to do this or I have to do that, then it's, it's difficult to get out of that sometimes. And so um, I think just what Lance was saying before of, um, you know, not comparing yourself because that's, that's kind of a slippery slope. Um, and I think the tension of um, having people doing different things is really it's going to happen anywhere. So it's not necessarily um, only for libraries or only for academic libraries or whatever. Um, does that does that make sense or does that answer the question, do you think, Lance? Yeah, I think so. And I'd like to add to there's one thing here that I guess a personal pet peeve of mine, this whole beneath me thing. I'm going to sound really pompous for a moment, so please forgive me. Okay, I just I want to apologize to everybody. But listen, I I was the Librarian of the Year for the Library Journal. I was Michigan Librarian of the Year. I was the Wayne State Distinguished Alumni. I won the Mover and Shaker Award. I got the award, uh, the Library of the Year Award in the fastest time since I, I've won like 11 awards. I've done so many different things, right? But the award that I'm most proud of is I won the Golden Plunger Award for being the best toilet unplugger in our entire system. <laughs> If somebody's got a problem, they got a code brown to give me, it's going down. Nobody should be above anything. I feel like as the leader of this organization, I need to be willing to, to do it, to get in there and to do the grunt work and to pick up garbage and not be so proud that I'm above stuff. So I, to me, listen, I'm just one gear in a big machine here. I had a conversation. We have a, a, a woman who works here at the service center where we do have all of our administrative suites and we do all of the uh, book processing and everything. And we were talking about all of us are gears in the same machine and every gear is important. And the work that happens that each gear does is important and all the other gears fit together with that. And I told her, I said, she said, I don't get to make the big decisions. And I said, yeah, but you know, but you keep the, the trains on time around here. And if you are doing what you were doing, you know, it would impact what I'm able to do, and, you know, there'd be a problem. So everything is important. Everybody is important. And, you know, having this sort of like some jobs are better than others, listen, all of it's important. Every part of it is important. Right. Sorry, right. I get all that. Really, I don't, I don't mean to sound pops on the other stuff. It just pisses me off. I've had people say that. like, well, I don't, I don't do this. <laughs> I do. You know, yeah. what, what is it about you? You don't do, you don't have time. Come on. Well, and you keep mentioning servant leadership, too. I think that's, I mean, that's really the embodiment of that is that, you know, if you see a problem, you fix it. Or if you, you exactly. know, see something happening, you, right, right. So was there some other part of that question, Cynthia, that we're not responding to? I think that was it. I think you addressed both both of those sets of questions. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. All right. Sorry, I get a little preachy on that. I don't mean to get all. No, no, that's why you're here. We want yeah. to hear your thoughts. So that's great. <laughs> okay, so the second question, um, how do you inspire people who seem disinterested in their work, even if they are capable of doing whatever that work is? What's your, what's your thought about this? Well, you know, first of all, I think that it's terrible to make assumptions. So I don't assume that people are always fully capable of doing something. Um, and if they... You know, are, first of all, it's important to see if there's a, if there's a capability issue. I mean, are, are they are they are the accommodations right? Are they having ergonomic problems? Is there a health issue? Is there something going on in their personal life? What's what's happening with them? So diagnosing what's going on with them is the first step. The second thing is is maybe it is they just are disinterested because they're bored. Um, I think it's important to sit down and, and challenge folks and say. Okay, so you're bored, you feel like you could do more. Um, or maybe maybe the instructions, you know, aren't adequate. Maybe maybe you don't have clear enough guidance. I mean, there's something going on. So you can challenge them or provide them more instruction, but just meet with them. And the other thing that I do at KBL is I go around, I work desk shift. And I put, I do book shelving, and I do every job in the library. I really suck at all of them because, you know, I don't practice all the time. And so the employees help me do it. So I, I see stuff that's going on, and they, I, it helps me kind of have a better understanding, be more empathetic about where the flat spots might be and what, you know, what might be going on. What can we do to make it better, make it easier, you know, make it more engaging? And so I think being aware of that as a leader is really extremely important, too. But again, 
communication is vital and getting a good sense of what's actually going on with the person and then figuring out maybe they need a new challenge, maybe they need better directions, um, maybe it's just not a good work environment for them, maybe they, they're not interested in the work, maybe they want to do something else in their life. And if that's the case, help make that happen. Perfect. Well, I see that we have 15 minutes, so I will move on, if you don't mind, to the next two questions. Um, so the first one um, on the slide is, how do you cope with the dysfunction dysfunctional environment when you've inherited it, either because you are new in the job or that you have moved up? Um, I'm assuming that's what this question is, um, moved up into that role. Um, that's something I've actually experienced is, you know, moving into um, a role where I was a colleague and then now I'm a supervisor, and um, there was a certain amount of dysfunction that was happening in the unit. So um, I'll speak to this question. Um, I think it's easiest if you just kind of stop this as soon as you can, whatever the dysfunction, um, dysfunctional behavior is, uh, because first the, the employee seeing you as their new supervisor um, will will maybe they're trying to test your boundaries, I guess is what I'm thinking. And so um, if you just tell them straight away, you know, these are my values, this is what, you know, you're doing that's conflicting with the way the unit is trying to go or the library is trying to go, um, then um, they will see you addressing that. And everyone else around in the department, unit, library, whatever, will also see that. And I think they will understand then where you're coming from and what, um, what your values are. I think saying um, those kinds of things, like kind of going broken record on them, is really important, is just to um, say who you are and what you expect. Um, and if there is something that um, I think in the, the second question kind of alludes to this of inappropriate behavior that's been allowed to continue for a long time, I think um, if you say, you know, today is the day that we are going to change this behavior, and I know that this maybe has happened for a long time or in this inherited um, case or whatever, that there, there may have been behaviors that were acceptable, but today, as of today, with me as your supervisor or whatever, you know, role you have, this is going to change. Um, we need to start doing, you know, this new behavior. Um, so for the second question, I'll just kind of combine them since I kind of just did, um, of having inappropriate behavior that was allowed to fester for years um, and how to shut it down. So the examples that were given in the question were being rude to presenters, so kind of more an active um, inappropriate behavior, and then rolling eyes during meeting, that's kind of like a nonverbal inappropriate behavior. I think to me that says that there's many things going on here that um, could be causing dysfunction. And so I think um, kind of the bad attitude or whatever that this person is having or these people are having um, are really just signs of disrespect to both the presenter that they're talking to or to you as the person leading the meeting. Um, and I think having these kind of clear conversations where you say, you know, you are doing this thing and I expect you to do something different um, because it's impacting your job or it's impacting, you know, the collegiality or the climate of your work, I think that's just really important to do. Um, and I think it really just promotes kind of positive progress. I think it's something, too, that um, if there is something like we said a couple of slides ago of having policies about things, um, like maybe it's possible to just set the ground rule of we don't roll our eyes during meetings. That's you know that's something that that you could just remind people of is that we are we are polite to people, we are polite to everyone, um, and then kind of hold them accountable for that. <clears throat> Another thought I had about um, both of these things are to directly ask the people, like you've been saying, Lance, of ask them what they're doing, like why are you doing this thing? And so you could even say it in like a really non-accusatory way, like tell me what it means when you roll your eyes during meetings or, you know, when you interrupted Mr. Smith the other day in um, his presentation. And it, really if your employee is a pretty, you know, reflective person or is, you know, being completely honest, then they could say something like, well, you know, it, I, I did it because I, I rolled my eyes because I was tired of being interrupted or I rolled my eyes because I have an eye issue and my, the muscles in my eye twitch or, you know, something. Um, and it, then you can say to them, oh, well, thank you very much for saying that or letting me know because I could have assumed that you were being rude or I could have assumed that what you intended was to be rude. And so, you know, I'm glad that we don't have that disagreement or whatever. Um, so it, it just seems like having the discussion, it seems to be what we keep saying is make sure to have the discussion and not make those assumptions. 
So did you have anything to add about these plants? Well, I, I also think, yes, um, thank you so much, and nice, nicely answered. Um, I mean, I got to say that my, every directorship that I, I've had in library land is every time I've come in, it's been a dysfunctional environment. And I frankly, I love to come into a library that is, there's a dysfunctional corporate environment because I, it's, it's easy to be successful right out of the gate just by being nice to people. You know, uh -huh. you start talking to people and holy cow, I mean, you know, it's like, wow, go figure, you know, talk to you just like a regular old person and no, I didn't yell that and they would have cared about what I had to say. So I, I kind of like, I, I like, uh, I, I like coming into dysfunctional environments. Um, mm -hmm. As far as people rolling their eyes and, and acting, you know, kind of, you know, frankly, it's, it's, it's just, unless there's a medical issue, it's just immature makes them look stupid. And mm -hmm. I, you know, it, it reflects poorly on them because, again, we are all responsible for our own behavior and ourselves, and our accountability needs to be high because if we don't represent just ourselves, we represent our community and our profession. And so I think it's important to remind people that they're not, they don't just look, it's not reflecting on just them badly. It reflects on all of us badly. You know, mm -hmm. we, in 2008, the OCLC Voter Perception Survey, 74% of the people that were surveyed said they vote for, or more likely to vote for a library millage. And this year, this 58% of the people are likely to vote for a library millage. So people have, you know, people's perceptions of what we do is, is, is being damaged. And so I think it's important that we're always putting our best face forward because people's interactions with the folks in the library kind of informs their idea of what we are and what we do, and they carry that forward. If you talk to a lot of people about their experiences in libraries, a lot of times it's negative. It goes back to when they were traumatized as a kid, getting shushed, you know, people acting obnoxious <laughs> to them, right? So we don't want to carry that forward. And rolling your eyes at people and that sort of behavior, that is not conducive to moving our cause forward. Sorry. Right. No, no. Okay, we've got um, a couple of more questions. So yeah, the first question ahead. is, what happens when the administration or the administrators are um, the root of the dysfunctional behavior, when they themselves are behaving dysfunctionally? Is that kind of outside of the sphere of influence? And the second question is, what happens when the dysfunctional behavior occurs when a particular person is not there to see it? So kind of... Um, it's more hidden, but it's there when they're not around. If you could address those two, thank you. Um, sure. Do you want to go first, Julian, or do you want me to do it? I'd say go ahead. I'll think about it while you're talking. <laughs> sure. I mean, when in a situation, and I've worked at places that there's been kind of poor leadership that's been petty and it almost felt like middle school. And frankly, um, I think that. You know, if you feel like it's a safe enough environment where you can talk to the the, the administrator and say, hey, you know, um, I kind of noticed this was going on. Can I, you know, can I give you some some feedback? And you feel like that's going to be okay and there's not going to be repercussions for it, I'd encourage you to do that. Um, again, always remember you're responsible for your own behavior. So it doesn't mean you should act that way. Um, the other thing is, is that I've been in situations where, you know, it was the fish rot from the head. So it was such a dysfunctional situation that people that I knew, um, they were leaving. They were finding a better environment because they knew they weren't going to be able to do their best work in that environment. So that's also a possibility. Um, and then the other question was, um, oh, shoot. About the, the hidden dysfunction. Oh, we do or that all the time. administration is dysfunctional. You document everything, and, you know, I mean, if it's being reported by other employees, you have to, if you hear something, you have to do an investigation. You do an investigation, you document, and then if you're in a unionized environment, I mean, you go through the steps. You work with your HR uh, person, or maybe you are the HR person, and you go through the steps. You have, um, you do your interview. If it comes up that you believe that there's been, you know, something going on and you need to address it and you call the person in and maybe they need to have a union representation there and you go through the steps and, you know, you might need to have a performance improvement plan. There might be a write-up, maybe it's a verbal, but document everything. I mean, you don't need to always witness everything yourself, 
in order to address an issue. If you have cause to believe there is an issue and your investigation supports your belief, then you have a duty to act on that. Yeah, and I think too that if um, if there's kind of one dysfunctional behavior, it seems to me that there's often many, um, or at least several. So it seems like um, it's it's often easy to figure out what is happening and like who the dysfunctional person mostly is or who is most contributing to this dysfunction. So it seems like um, even if you don't specifically witness whatever it is that somebody is reporting to you, um, there likely are other things that you may have noticed. So uh, this slide has our email addresses on here, so feel free to email us. I just I just want to say that before um, we have any more questions. But Cynthia, is there anything else, or Ginger from the Twitter Twitter account? We do have one more question about um, any advice for dealing with passive aggressive behavior, i.e., gossiping, spreading rumors. Yeah, I hate passive aggressive behavior. Um, yeah. you know, the fact of the matter is, is I think that uh, if you're hearing about things, people spreading rumors or um, in your, you know, in a managerial role. Um, I think you know, you gossiping or causing issue and spreading, you know, sort of, we call it the moldy strawberry. You go buy a little carton of strawberries, you know, and there's one on the bottom, you don't see it's got mold on it. That's right. that sort of passive aggressive caustic behavior. We don't take care of that pretty quickly. The whole thing turns moldy. So the best thing to do is, is call it out and talk to people about it, give them clear direction about what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. Let them know, I mean, if they are, you know, violating their your employment policies and, and not doing their job and being a distract, distract, distraction or causing issue, you know, you have to deal with them. You might have to write them up. And if they can't get their stuff, you know, give them a chance to improve. And if they can't improve, you know, you have to take steps. You may have to get rid of them. Yeah, and I think it's easy to say something like, this is not an adult behavior or something that sounds kind of like that, like, you know, this is not um, the most mature thing to do, so um, maybe you need more work to do. Maybe you need, you know, like you were saying before, maybe you need more of a challenge at different things. Um, I see that we have three minutes left, so um, let me just go ahead and say two more things um, here, and then we can keep on talking. So there is a next, an upcoming scheduled Llama PAM conversation, which is tentatively scheduled for Thursday, July 26th at the same time, so 2 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Central. And then we do have a survey um, to do some, you know, brief assessment of this conversation today. So I'll go ahead and put this up here because it has a QR code and a slightly complicated URL. Um, so if you want to go ahead and start thinking about those things, uh, we can keep chatting as you um, think about how you want to respond to these questions. So any more questions, Cynthia or Ginger? Yes. Um, what advice okay. or insight could you lend to a staff um, who's working under what they consider to be a micromanager, and kind of part two, how do you, in, a, in an assistant kind of supervisory role, help change the climate for the staff that you would supervise as well as the manager that you report to? Mm -hmm. Those are big questions. Yeah. I think um, that if you're so working with a micromanager, um, I think it's important to be honest. I think um, and say, listen, I, you know, um, I feel like uh, uh, I have this, and um, I want you to trust me. I mean, you hired me to, to do this job, and you, you know, I need you to trust me on this. And if I need some help, I, I'll let you know. I'll be sure to let you know. I promise. Um, and if they get angry at that and they don't want to work that way, I think that. Uh, you might want to get your resume shined up and move on because micromanagers, if they're not willing to acknowledge and work with you, I mean, they're just going to keep the behavior up and you're just going to get frustrated. Yeah, I really think it comes down to trust. I think, like you said, yep. um, I really, I think it's yeah important just to do everything you can just to show that you're trustworthy and to um, maybe even ask them directly, what is it that I'm not doing that you're hoping that I'll do, or what is it that you're not trusting me about? And then for the second question that was about um, having, like not being the direct manager and how do you make trust kind of happen, um, even if you're not the the major supervisor or whatever, I think modeling behavior is um, probably for me the easiest thing to do or to say, to recommend. Um, I think so too. Yeah. That's, that's okay. a good answer. And I think talking okay. to that other manager is important <clears throat> and expressing, you know, you know, I've had some concerns. I, I feel like, uh, you know, there's there's some 
kind of unnecessary angst going on that's interfering with our work here. And, you know, I want to know if you, you know, would be willing to, you know, trust me enough to have, you know, a, a, an open conversation between us about it. And again, you know, they might say no, but I would hope they would say yes. You know, I'm only, I'm only perfect in my imperfection, and I think that's a good thing to try to be. Okay. Well, I think that's the end of our time. So I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, I see that somebody's asked for the survey link to be put in the chat, so maybe somebody could do that for them before we say goodbye. Um, is there anything else that we need to address really fast, Cynthia? I just want to thank everybody. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank Nothing you. Nothing that, so that I can see right now. Sorry. I'm sorry okay. to interrupt. Um, I no, think that's fine. Thank you very much, good. Lance. I really appreciate talking with you. Yeah, likewise. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a good week. Yeah, you too. Thanks. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Yep.